Coming up, a cute little calf abducted in broad daylight. Who's the mystery cattle rustler? Who kissed Grandpa's photo? Clever chemistry catches the culprit. A precious pooch kidnapped in broad daylight. Which witness is telling the truth? And who stole a top secret recipe? Our clever detectives are on the case. Nothing better than a cut and dried case of kitchen espionage, I think. No, I'm not so sure how cut and dried it really is, Shay. But we'll solve that little mystery later. First up, there's been a dog napping over on Dean Street. Ooh, a dog napping? Yeah, it's like a kidnapping, but instead of someone taking a kid, they take a dog. Right, it all makes sense. And I suppose a reward is being offered. Yeah, huge. Whoa. Well, let's go see what's happened. Poor Mrs Tingle. Her faithful friend Badger has disappeared. She's offering a big reward. <coughs> hey, that sounds like... It's Badger. Here, boy. Looks like Finley's found him. Mrs Tingle is going to be so happy. And Finley will get the reward. He says Badger was dognapped and that he saw him in the park with the stranger. <coughs> Finley called and Badger came running. He didn't see the stranger's face, but Finley does remember what the dog napper was wearing. Jeans and a red zip-up jacket. I can think of three people who always wear red. There's Otto, Nicholas and Gabriel. So they've got to be our dog-napping suspects. Brooke and I are going to get to the bottom of this. We don't want a dog-napper on the loose. Dog-napping can be a serious crime. In 2008, two Canadian men kidnapped a Labrador for a $15,000 ransom. But they were caught and charged with fraud. There he is, suspect number one, Otto. I wonder where he was this morning, doing his paper run, he claims. Are you sure? He still says he was delivering papers all morning. Well, that's easy to check on. Hmm, he has distributed a lot of papers. Otto's alibi is rock solid. We'll cross him off the suspect list. That leaves Nicholas and Gabriel. Nicholas first, but he claims he was gardening all morning. He had loads of seedlings to plant. OK, yep, <laughs> likely story. But there is dirt on his top. Yep, just planted. So Nicholas was telling the truth too. So he's off the list as well. Next up, Gabriel. He says he's been at football training and just got off the bus. And the timestamp on his ticket proves it. So he's in the clear too. All our suspects have solid alibis. So who was our dog napper? Solving crimes is a tricky business. First, there's the evidence to collect. Then, it's important to talk to people who may have seen what happened. Interviewing eyewitnesses takes a lot of time, but it often produces vital evidence. By matching different versions of what happened at a crime scene, police work out who's telling the truth and who's not. Computers are often used to track where suspects and witnesses were when the crime was committed. By combining all the evidence and all the eyewitness reports, investigators piece together what happened at a crime scene. Most important of all, who the guilty person was. Wow, I never realised how tricky interviewing witnesses could be. Mm, I always thought people told the truth when police questioned them. At least we know our witnesses are truthful. Well, Otto did seem to be doing his paper round. Yes, and Nicholas is certainly wearing a grubby jacket. Mm, and Gabriel's ticket showed that he had been to football training. Yeah, so they all seem to be telling the truth. But someone isn't. I wonder who. Well, let's hope Dean and Brooke can find out soon. 
Mrs. Tingle has offered a reward for her missing dog. Finley says Badger was dognapped by a stranger wearing a red zip-up jacket. But our suspects who fit that description all have watertight alibis. We're back to square one. I need to think. You know, something about Finley's story doesn't add up. He said he didn't see the dog napper's face. So he must have seen him from behind only. I wish Brooke would leave that zipper alone. Whoa, that's it, the zipper. If Finley saw the dog napper from behind, there's no way he could have known the jacket had a zip on the front. He was trying to divert attention away from his own sneaky plan. He stole Badger, knowing Mrs Tingle would offer a reward. Our dog napper is Finley. <laughs> Good work, guys. That was thorough and clever detective work. A person who claims to have seen a crime or a criminal is known as an eyewitness, but eyewitness evidence can be flawed. Smart detectives know that witnesses can forget important details, misunderstand what they see, and even lie. So it's important to gather other kinds of evidence before declaring a case closed. There's Finley now. He's claiming the reward. Not so fast, dog napper. Mrs Tingle will be very interested to hear what happened to Badger. All of a sudden, Finley's remembered he's got homework to do. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, so it was Finlay after all. I thought I smelt a rat. It's funny you say that because I thought I smelled something really delicious coming from Jed's mum's kitchen. Mum's a famous chef and she's trying out a brand new dish on her staff. It's a top secret recipe. I hope there'll be some leftovers. Let's go play games on the computer. What's this? It's the recipe for Mum's top secret dish. She'd never leave it open on her screen. Someone must have snuck in and copied it. It's time for the good old pencil trick. Rub away. Whoa. It looks like... Yes! Someone has copied it. And it's got to be one of Mum's staff. It's either Mum's business partner, Madam Curry, or Jerry the chef, or Ian, the maitre d'. Any one of them could make a fortune by selling the recipe. Time for some quick detective work. They can't leave here with Mum's secret recipe. Thousands of years ago, ancient Egyptians wrote their recipes on special paper called papyrus. Papyrus was made from reeds that grew along the River Nile. And some of those papyrus recipes still exist today. Let's go look for clues. Whoa, what's that? A handkerchief. That could be a clue. Maybe it's a thief's. Aha, uh -huh. MC. Does it stand for Madame Curry? Surely not. She's one of Mum's oldest friends. But she does have expensive tastes. So she might be planning to sell the recipe for extra money. This doesn't smell like her sort of perfume though. This is too flowery. Hey, that gives me an idea. Follow me. Oh, perfume. It's one of my favourite things. I love getting perfume for my birthday. <clears throat> hint, hint. <laughs> yeah, thanks. They all smell pretty much the same to me. What? 
Stephen, you know nothing, my friend. I'm about to educate you in the secret art of perfume sniffing. Here, oh. what does that remind you of? I'll give you a hint, it's flowery. Uh, roses. No, it's gardenia glow. What about this one? Uh, it smells a little bit like bacon and eggs. You're hopeless. <laughs> it's morning mist. Now try this. Afternoon delight. Oh, man. I give up. You have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of the subtle smell of the finer fragrances. <laughs> You're right. I'd be really hopeless at trying to find out who stole that secret recipe. Well, it's just as well we have Jed and Brooke on the case. Mum was testing a top secret recipe on her staff, but one of them snuck into her study and copied it. The only clue is a scented handkerchief. We're going to see if we can match the smell of the staff's coats and scarves with the perfume on the handkerchief. Here's Madame Curry's. Yep, that smells just like Madame Curry's perfume. Not at all like the flowery scent on the handkerchief. Let's cross her off the suspect list. Now for Ian's. What do they tell us? Oh, they tell us Ian needs a good wash. Definitely not a match. He's off the list too, which leaves Jerry the chef. Yeah, what do you reckon? Yep, definitely the same as the handkerchief. And what's this? Perfume with the initials MC. The MC on the handkerchief doesn't stand for Madame Curry. It's a brand of perfume. Let's check Jerry's other pocket. Could it be? It is. Mum's top secret recipe. Jerry the chef is headed for the chopping block. Excellent detective work. Because there are so many perfumes and deodorants that have slightly different smells, and because the human nose is good at detecting them, a person's scent is often a giveaway at a crime scene. Just as Jerry's scented handkerchief led our clever detectives straight to the primary evidence, the stolen recipe. We're gonna teach Jerry a lesson by making some subtle changes that'll turn Mum's delicious recipe into something truly disgusting. Whoever buys it and tries it is in for a stomach-churning experience. <laughs> Claire's favourite calf, T-Bone, is missing. She took a weird photo last week. Now she's convinced T-Bone's been abducted by aliens. I'm not. Nah, gotta be a logical explanation. Let's have another look. Is he amongst that lot? No? How about over here then? Can't see him. Someone's got to have taken him. Let's think. It can only be one of two people. Dad, he's always moving the cattle around. Or Helena, she loves playing with the baby calves. Come on, with a bit of detective work, we'll find a down-to-earth explanation for this missing calf. More people report seeing UFOs during earthquakes. This may be because earthquakes change the Earth's magnetic field. Magnetic changes could affect our brains, making some people think they're seeing aliens. Now, the first thing is to search the obvious calf hangouts. Hmm, T-Bone's not in the cow pen. No, Claire, there's no way he was taken by aliens. Come on, let's see if someone's fiddled with the cow pen gate. They have! Now, Helena's pretty short. She barely comes up to here. Yep, I'm sure of it. The latch is too high for Helena. So that probably rules her out, which leaves Dad as prime suspect. 
So let's check the gate for his fingerprints. Forget your aliens. This calls for good old-fashioned detective work. First, we dust the railing, brush away the excess, and... Hmm, no print. That means Dad's probably in the clear too. I've run out of ideas. And Claire's still going on about UFOs. She wants me to see where she took the alien photo. Whoa! It's a waste of time. But I'm all out of sensible explanations. Why do people believe in such things as UFOs and haunted castles? Some scientists say it's because our brains may be affected by magnetic fields. In most places, magnetic fields are smooth. But in places where people think there are ghosts, like this castle, magnetic fields change much more. And if you sleep on a metal bed like this one, you're more likely to think there are ghosts because the metal mesh can become highly magnetised. Just maybe ghosts and UFOs are all in the mind because of magnetism. Although nobody knows for sure. Seeing is believing, I say, and I've never seen a UFO. I think it's all a bit of a joke, really. Well, if you think UFOs are a joke, how's this one? Why do cats hate flying saucers? Why? They spill their milk. Uh. <laughs> OK, try this one, Steve. Why do aliens make crop circles? I don't know. Because they're corny. Get it? They're corny? Yeah, I get it. I get it, Shady. I think your jokes are a little bit corny. What? Just a little bit. And I've never seen a crop circle for that matter either. <laughs> well, keep watching because you might be in for a surprise. Claire thinks a UFO abducted her favourite calf. I've been trying to solve the case with logic and forensic science, but my investigation has stalled. Now we're stuck with Claire's bizarre theory. OK, so this is the place. Whoa! What's happened here? Looks like crop circles. Maybe a flying saucer did land here. Maybe Claire isn't crackers after all. T-Bone really was abducted by aliens. Oh, hi, Helena. Check this out. An alien spaceship came down and... Huh? T-Bone! Helena had him all along. She's the mystery abductor. <laughs> yep, as always, there's a logical explanation. Matthew and Claire missed just one tiny clue. There was a milk crate left lying near the gate. And this is what Helene used to stand on to reach the latch and take T-Bone for a walk. All Matthew's other forensic techniques were spot on, but solving tricky crimes can often depend on the smallest, most insignificant looking piece of evidence. Miss that and the mystery goes unsolved. Thank goodness T-Bone is safe and sound. How crazy to think an alien abducted him. What's that sound? It couldn't be. Nah, there's no such thing. I still don't believe my eyes. I think it's all done with smoke and mirrors, Shay. <laughs> oh, Stephen, speaking of mirrors, Yelena is throwing a 1920s party and she's about to get a big surprise in front of her mirror. Let's head to the party. How simply smashing do we look? We've got the beads, the swanky dresses, everything we need for a 1920s party. We've heard all about the roaring 20s from my grandpa. And now for the finishing touches, some bright red lipstick. Hang on. Someone's been kissing Gramps. How disrespectful can you get? Right. Which one of you ladies vandalised this photo? No one, eh? Don't worry, Gramps. I'll find out who this cheeky kisser is. 
all the suspects are right here. There's Brooke, she's playing all innocent. And Kate, looking as if butter wouldn't melt in her lipsticky mouth. And his light-hearted Louisa covering up her guilt. This calls for some fancy forensic footwork. Let's see. Red lipstick. Well, that's tricky. They're all wearing red lipstick. But they are different brands. They look the same, but are they? I'm gonna have to test them all. And I know just how to do it. Those ditzy dames won't know what's hidden. Ancient Egyptian pharaoh Cleopatra loved wearing red lipstick. The red colour came from crushed carmine beetles. And the lipstick stuck to Cleopatra's lips thanks to a mixture of sticky ants' eggs. <sighs> to start, a quick dab of lipstick from the photo. This is the first step in my clever experiment. Then I'll pop it onto one of my cardboard strips. Now, samples from the girl's lipstick. I've identified whose is whose with coloured dots. Next, some rubbing ointment. Gramps uses it on his sore joints. And that's four. OK. Each strip goes into its own glass. Yep, the ointment's already starting to seep up the strip. As it travels up, it will carry some of the lipstick with it. Each brand will leave a slightly different pattern. And whichever one matches the lipstick from the photo will tell me who the mystery kisser is. Wow, this is a highly scientific story. And because it involves one of my favourite things, lipstick, I'm going to conduct a little experiment of my own. Good idea. Now, I'll just put this lipstick on you. What? No, <laughs> not again. Come on. No, what is it won't take long. Mm -hmm. Besides, this burnt orange looks just fabulous on you. <laughs> now, take this card, press your lips against it. I'll do mine too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel a little bit silly, but that's OK. Yeah, you look a bit silly too, but it's all in the interest of science. <laughs> Mwah. Let's compare. Oh, I quite like the burnt orange, but the pink is good. Wait a minute, too. hang on. I thought this was for science, Shay. Well, it is. I just want to see which colour looks better. <laughs> I think we should get back to Yelena, who's putting her scientific knowledge to much better use. One of these flappers smooched all over my grandpa's photo. No one's owned up, so I've set off a cunning experiment. It will show me exactly whose lipstick was used to commit the crime. I've rounded up my suspects, and now it's time to reveal the guilty party. These lipstick samples will tell all. I'm looking for a match to this one. OK. It's taken from the kiss mark left on Grandpa's photo. First, Louise's. Hmm, no match. The spread of colours is different from the one on the photo. You're in the clear, Louisa. Now for Kate's sample. Totally different. The colours hardly spread at all. So Kate's off the hook as well. So that leaves Brooke. Ready? Aha! We have a match. She's been caught red-handed. Or should that be red-lipped? Brooke is the mystery kisser. <laughs> nice crime-solving, Yelena. Brooke was indeed the phantom kisser. While no one was looking, she snuck up to Grandpa's photo and planted big smackers all over it. Brooke wasn't really being disrespectful. She's just one of Gramps' biggest fans. But she was found out by an important forensic tool called liquid chromatography. Every brand of lipstick is made from a unique combination of colours. When Gramps' rubbing ointment dissolves the colours and carries them up the cardboard strip, they separate. And the way they separate identifies which brand is which, enabling our clever detective to match the culprit's lipstick with the one at the crime scene. Brooke's cleaned off the lipstick now, but she's not getting off that easily. 
she has to perform the magnificent 1920s Charleston dance for us. Go, Brooke. I'm sure Gramps will be most impressed. <laughs> well, maybe not. Oh, I don't know. I thought Brooke's dancing was pretty terrific. Mm, and I thought Yelena's crime solving was top class. Well, it is our specialty on this show, and we'll have more dazzling crime solving next time. Bye. Bye.